Uh, for any of you visiting today or don't know who I am, my name is Matt Haggard. Um, I work with Brother Chris and Bear, mainly with the children's ministry here. I uh, took over for Josh Lott when he left, and some of y'all probably wish he was still here. But uh, even before that, we were uh, kind of involved, pretty involved in the children's ministry before that. Uh, me and my beautiful wife, Jenny, who's over there. Um, but in the last three years, God has really turned some things upside down in my life, and that's the main reason I'm standing up here today. Um, now, if you heard me speak at Baptist Men's Day, I don't know, two years ago, a year ago, and then I got to speak again several months after that, you may have heard me give my testimony and say that I was saved when I was 10 years old. But as I prepared my testimony, I realized I was missing one of the three most important parts. Um, allow me to explain. If you're a Christian, you have a testimony. I didn't know that. I thought only people that used to be really bad, like convicted felons that changed their lives, I thought that was a testimony. Like if you were, you know, if you had, I was just kind of normal. Just, But anyway, you do. If you're a Christian, you have a testimony. And that testimony has three parts. I learned this from Bear when he came back from uh, youth camp. They talked about it a lot down there. Part one is your life before Christ. Part two is your encounter with Christ, when you realized you were lost and a sinner and that you needed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then part three was the part that I was missing. That's the part of how your life has changed after your encounter with Christ. Now I'll get a little more into that in just a second, but... I want to share some other things with you. See, back when we had our revival and Colby King was here, after months of praying about it and talking to Brother Chris about it and putting it off for as long as I possibly could, I decided to surrender my life to the gospel ministry of Jesus Christ. And at the time, I didn't know how God was going to use me. I thought maybe as a children's minister or a youth minister, maybe, but I really didn't care. I just wanted to serve God however he wanted to use me. I mean, I, it was like burning inside me to, to help share God's word with people. Um, and, and I think that every Christian should be like that. After that part three, when your life starts to change, you should want to share that. You should want to know more. Um, so opportunities came up for me to speak a few times here and there. I spoke at the school one time. I spoke here a couple of times. Um, I got the opportunity to lead a discipleship class with some of the youth on Monday nights. And, you know, at first I didn't want to do it. I'm like, man, we already drive over here two or three times a week. If one more, it's gas money. You know, it's, but I'm so glad I did it. I've learned so much from doing that. So I like it so much that my mom asked me to teach Bible study at her apartment complex. And I didn't want to do that either because I'm lazy. I like to sit at home and play video games and be selfish with my time. But I agreed to do that too, and I'm so thankful that I did because I've learned so much. I mean, in, in preparing to share things with people, you, it forces you to study and learn stuff. And that's how we're supposed to be. So when Chris asked me if I wanted to speak today, I immediately said yes, because I totally feel like it is such an honor to get up here and share God's truth with people. It just, it makes you feel so good inside. And it may not be that impressive to y'all. I hope that you get something out of it. I mean, I know God's going to use something I say for at least one person here. So, I mean, that gives me comfort in it. But it just, you know, you feel like you're, actually doing work for the Lord, which is what we're supposed to do, right? Um, but after I said yes, I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? I mean, just recently, you've covered like most everything. Everybody's going to already know everything, right? And then Jennifer Green said, well, maybe you can say something in a different way that somebody else might understand. So I was like, you know, that's possible because I'm a pretty simple-minded little country boy and you know, for me to understand something, it's got to be 
relatively simple terms, you know, like crayon drawings and stuff like that. So, I mean, if I can understand that, maybe I could simply explain it to something else, somebody else where they might understand it. So, uh, so I just want to jump in and share some of the things I've learned recently. This came up in one of the Disciple 6 lessons, and it, it really hit me and made me think. So you got to do me a favor. Y'all, if you've heard me speak before, you know I like scenarios and pictures and illustrations and things. I like to get people involved because it forces you to put yourself in the situation and not just listen to somebody ramble on for 45 minutes. So imagine this. Put yourself in this situation. Let's say you're at a Savoy baseball game. You're setting up in the stands when the topic of Christianity comes up. And some of the people in the stands, they know you're a Christian. They know you go to church. So they start asking you questions about your faith. And some people think that the reality of pain and suffering in the world shows that God doesn't exist. Others argue that evolution explains everything we need to know about the universe. And still others want to know if you have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. And they're all looking to you for those answers. Would this type of scenario excite you or put you in a panic? Three years ago, I would have got up and went to the hot dog stand or something. I'd be like, I don't know. I don't want to answer these questions. I don't want people looking at me for that. But I was like, you know, just come to church with me on Sunday. Well, Ask the preacher. He knows. He knows all these answers. That's his job to know that stuff, right? (laughs) Well, guess what? It's our job to know that stuff too. It's called apologetics. And that doesn't mean saying you're sorry or knowing how to say you're sorry or anything like that. It very simply means being able to defend your faith. And in order to do that, you kind of have to know information. You have to know the who's and the why's and you have to know what you believe and why you believe it. Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's not just for preachers. That's not just for missionary people. That's every one of us. Every one of us in this room that say we're Christians, we're supposed to go forth and share the gospel with people and make disciples. If you're going to make a disciple, shouldn't you be one? And if you're going to be one, don't you have to know what it takes to be one? All this stuff hit me. I was like, man, I don't know this stuff. I was just roaming along for my entire life thinking I was good to go. You know, I said a prayer when I was 10 years old. I'm, I'm ready. And I was wrong. So it's important to me, this part is so important to me because I don't want anybody else to be like that. I don't want anybody to be blind to to the truth of knowing what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live. So if this situation of people asking you questions about your faith puts you in a panic, then you may need to examine your faith a little closer. You may need to Figure out what you believe and why. In 1 Peter 3.15, he says, Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for your hope that's in you. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Always be ready to give a defense for what you believe, why you believe in Jesus. Why do you believe in Jesus? Because... When you're in vacation Bible school, somebody told you he existed? Or do you believe in him because he's changed you, made a difference in your life? That's why I believe in him. I mean, I can read the Bible all day long, but if I believe that it's true because I've seen what he's done in my life and how he's changed me. That's what makes it real and easy to understand. So this basically means put Christ first in your life. Know how you're supposed to live and know why you're supposed to live that way. And then be ready to tell other people why you do it. But notice the last part. It says do this in a gentle and respectful way. 
Don't get all mad and argue and act like a non-Christian because when you do that, it weakens your testimony. And what that means is if you're at that Savoy baseball game and people start talking about it, you can't go, yeah, it's this way, it's that way because it says right here in the Bible. Because that person may know that that's just how you are. I'm like that. I mean, I get wound up. I may not be mad. My wife asks me all the time. She's like, why are you yelling? Like, I'm not yelling. This is just my normal volume when I discuss things. <laughs> but you know what? There are people around watching. And you're, how you defend your faith, the gentleness and the manner you do it and live it, is being a witness to other people. The goal of it is not to win an argument. You are supposed to be a witness for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit living in us is the defendant in this. If it was a court case, the Holy Spirit would be the defendant. It, it gives you the defense, the power, the answers you need if you read and study the word. We're supposed to be a witness. We share our account of what happened, what we saw. So we're expected to read God's word and live it and be ready to defend it with answers when people have questions about it. I did not know that. I didn't. I didn't realize the importance of it. But let me show you in a different scenario. Okay? Let's say we're going to have vacation Bible school here and there's 100 kids coming. We need adult volunteers to come help talk to kids that come down during the invitation. How many of you have passed on opportunities like that to share Jesus because you don't think you know what to say or you don't know enough about it. I did. I didn't think it was my job to do this. I thought, Brother Chris, Bear, they got this stuff covered. But it's my job. We should all be able to share Jesus and know the hows and whys of it. It made me ashamed of myself. I was ashamed that I claimed to have life-saving faith in Jesus, but I didn't know enough about it to share it with others like I was supposed to. But I'm changing. I'm trying to make changes every day to make me more like Jesus because that's what we're supposed to do. We should want to change to be more like Christ. And that brings up the second thing I want to talk about today. I've learned through all my research and study that I feel without a doubt that God is leading me towards discipleship training. Um, I want to make sure that there aren't other people out there like me that didn't know what's expected of, of a Christian. I know what you're thinking, wait, expected? There's nothing expected of me. I go down the aisle, I'll pray a prayer, I'm good. I'll turn around and go back to my normal life. That's not true. We think we just have to believe in Jesus and we're forgiven of everything. Well, that's true in a way, as long as your definition of believe matches God's definition of believe. Mine was not, and I'll explain. If some, let's take this scenario. If I told Bear, hey, I'll give you $10 million if you'll join the army for four years. $10 million, that's a pretty good deal. I'd jump all over that. And then he gets there, he goes off to boot camp. When he gets there, he sleeps in late, strolls on over to the mess hall in his pajamas for a short stack of pancakes, finishes his meal, goes back to the barracks for a little, you know, some mid-morning TV or maybe a nap or something like that. I mean, some of you military guys, you think that would fly? You think they'd let him do that? And he just says, man, I'm just here to... You know, I just had to join. He'd get court-martialed or kicked out or something because when you do something like that, you're expected to be a certain way. You're expected to follow directions. You're expected to follow your orders. That's pretty much how it is about believing in Christ. Listen to this verse, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This, <coughs> this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him 
must live as Jesus lived. That is very, very convicting. It's strong. It's not go down and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Now I'm going to go back to life as normal. You believe by living this way. That's how you show your belief. And it says, must live as Jesus did. I mean, now, we all mess up, and we're all going to stumble, but we're supposed to try to live as Jesus lived. We should want to. If Christ is in you, you should want to. And now we all want to listen to our favorite verse, John 3, 16. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, okay? That's saying you believe. But what that verse really, really means, if you look at it another way, that verse really means, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever obeys God's word and lives as Jesus did shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's a little bit different than the way we like to believe it. But that is the truth. I always wanted to pretend that... Uh, oh, now I'm not saying... I lost my place. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Here, here we go. So how can you obey God's word and live as Jesus did if you don't read and study the Bible? It's not just saying, yeah, I believe Jesus is a son. Now let me get back to my life of cussing and being mean to people, hating people, holding grudges, whatever it is we all have problems doing. We want it to be that easy because we don't really want to change. I mean, there are countless verses that cover how we need to be born again, made new, um, set apart. We're called to live a holy life. Holy means set apart. We're called to live holy lives, set apart from the world. I always heard about this wide path that the world was on, headed for hell or separation from God, and the narrow path that we're supposed to walk as Christians. And I always wanted to pretend that these two roads were, they're running parallel to each other, and they're really, really, really close together. And you could kind of walk right down the middle of them, you know, you could... Kind of go with the world, but, you know, go to church and be a Christian too. That's not how it is. The narrow path's going the other way. It's a totally different direction. It's set apart, a noticeably set apart life. Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Turn from God. So we... They can't be going in the same path because you have to turn to God. Now, it may be a 90-degree turn. It may be 180, but it is not going the same way that that road's going. We can all agree on that. If, if sin is the world and we have to stop and turn to God, then our path is different. Different directions that require change. We can't live like the world Monday through Saturday and then be all about God on Sunday. We have to change. And then we have to keep changing and learning and changing and learning until we become unified in Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, I got kind of a lot of scripture in here because it's good. It's very good. So you should read it. And if you won't, I will stand up here and read it for you. I, when I first started getting this together, I had six pages of just scripture that I wanted to read with y'all. And I knew that that would not be allowed. Someone would form tackle me and take me out before that happened. But, so I've condensed it a little bit. There's still some in here. In Ephesians, Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus about spiritual gifts. And this is, this is long, but listen to what he says. Therefore, I, prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worth, worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. 
For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Now these gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This is an important part right here. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll, we, we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standards of Christ. So it's a continual, ongoing process. It's a walk with Christ. It's not a stand on the pier with Christ, stand still and look out over the ocean. It's a walk. It's a continual process. Right here it says it. It's a continual process until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord. So then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. How about the lie of you don't have to change, you just have to ask Jesus to forgive you, and then you can keep living in sin. That's a lie that the world tricks us into believing. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, we all have spiritual gifts. Some of us don't even know what those are because we don't read and study. You, you need to read and study, know, know your spiritual gifts, and know how to apply it to the church, how you help, how you serve. And then how we're supposed to live. In verse 17, it says, With the Lord's authority, I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed minds and hardened their hearts. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. So since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from it, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. That sounds like a lot of change to me. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we're all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control your life. Man, that was me for a long time. Very bad temper. I didn't know it was wrong to be angry all the time. It was fun. It was like a hobby of mine to be angry. But I had to get rid of that. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for the anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good. Give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Mm, that was uh, number two on my list of hobbies. You would think I spent a lot of time in the Navy or something. And that was a hard one to give up, but just because it was, so, it was so much of a habit. But that's how I know Christ is in me and working because I have changed things that I would never think I would be capable of changing or getting rid of. Christ has helped me to change. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guarantee, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, 
as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. It's all about change, how we're supposed to be. And I was not doing hardly any of it. But now I know that I'm supposed to be like that. So I'm working to change that. In Romans 12, I love Romans. I know Chester loves Romans. Romans is awesome. Just pick up the Bible and read Romans. Any of Ephesians, man, any of Paul's letters. I'm a huge fan of Paul. Read some of his letters. They're awesome. In Romans 12, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Holy, set apart, different than the world. A holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You can be the best singer in the world. Like Kaylin, almost. Just kidding. But this is the way to truly worship him. I mean, if, you, if you're an awesome singer and you're singing songs to God and they sound awesome, but you're not changing, you're not living the way you're supposed to live, then what good are you really doing? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen to this part. This got me too. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Man, I was definitely using my own standards of measuring how good I was. It's crazy. I, I, don't, I don't have time to get into all that, but, you know, get with me sometime after church, I'll tell you. Paul is pleading with them. You've heard the term begged and pleaded. It means to ask with emotion and earnest concern. I plead with you today. Don't think you're better than you are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves by the faith God has given you. I was so wrong in my evaluation of myself. I don't want anybody else to be as wrong as I was. Think about the last thing that you changed about your life that would help you be more like Christ. If you haven't changed anything lately, then there's still work that you can do. If you haven't learned anything new from the Bible in a while, then guess what? You're not done. There's still stuff you can learn. There's still progress to be made. We all mess up and everyone sins. But if you're not changing the things in your life to stop that, if you're not trying to live as Jesus lived, then you could stand before Jesus one day and call out, Lord, Lord. And he could say, I never knew you. Get away. Ye who breaks God's laws. Can you imagine how terrible that would be? I mean, as Christians, we give up the carnal pleasures that the world has to offer, even if you're not fully doing it. I mean, like, you can be mistaken. I was mistaken about a lot of things, but I still gave up some stuff. But, I mean, can you imagine living a life that you think is sacrificing and then to get there and find out that there was, that wasn't enough? You never knew Christ? He never knew you? I don't want to do that. So if you ask me about that third part of my testimony, or if you ask me about apologetics, why I believe in Jesus, I can tell you, because he's made changes in me that I never thought were possible. He's turned my life upside down, and I have a hunger and a thirst for more understanding of God's word. I want to change to be more like Christ every day. Do you? Do you really want that? Are you obeying God's word and living as Jesus lived? Or has the world got you fooled into thinking you can live however you want 
because you prayed a prayer when you were 10 years old. Whatever the case may be, we can change all of that right here today. If you don't know Jesus, or if you were like me and you thought you had everything covered, but you weren't living the life that you needed to be, then come down here and fix that today between you and God. Don't let another day go by being blinded to the truth that you need to know.